a textual critic takes the ancient manuscripts of the Bible, the pieces of parchment that were found all over the world, and he has to learn uh, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, you know, these languages that these parchments have been found in. And he has to take these scriptures and try to find out where they came from, uh, why there are variations in the many different versions of the same parchment. Let's say you have Matthew chapter 1 from the Bible. There might be 5,000 different variant readings of Matthew chapter 1 in six languages. And so he has to be able to take all these and sift through them, try to find out why there's so many variations of the readings, and then determine which one is the original. Um, and that's not as easy a task as seeing you could figure, you know, which one of the oldest is probably a more original, which is not the case since there are no originals. Uh, you might have one parchment that is the oldest parchment of the of the of the group, but it might be a copy of 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 a copy with with laden with mistakes. If you read about Noah in the Bible, there is the story about Noah saving uh, uh, humanity from the flood with an ark and all of that. There is this in the Bible. There's other another aspect to the story of Noah that that not many people know about unless they actually take time to open a Bible. This will not be preached from any pulpit anywhere. Is that the, the Bible says that Noah was an alcoholic. This is the Bible's portrayal of Noah, or Nuh alayhi salam, that he was an alcoholic, he was a drunkard. This is the word used in the Bible, that he was a man given to alcohol. And <clears throat> I'm a psychology major, and my, my, my uh, field of specialty is mental illnesses, and, and alcoholism is one of those, is, is a mental illness. And I know from seeing alcoholism's effect on one of my close uh, friend's parents, uh, I know that someone who is truly addicted to alcohol, and if Noah lived for so long addicted to alcohol, he was seriously addicted to alcohol, um, it is hard for someone addicted to alcohol to hold down a nine to five job working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers, much less construct an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. So that stopped me for a moment in my tracks. And I said, no, as an alcoholic, you know, and, and it, it bothered me for a minute because I said, I, you know, things started popping in my mind. Like if Noah was a drunkard, how did he know God was talking to him? Because, you know, I've seen some people, the alcoholics, you know, you were just asleep in my dog's food bowl the other night drooling and now you're telling me you were talking to God last night. You know, this, this you know, to rationally that would not make sense to me. That's like, you know, an alcoholic on the street coming to you and tell you God's talking to him. You know, he has no, this would give this man no validity. This man has no validity with anyone. So, I didn't pay it too much attention. It caught me, but I said, you know what, I'm going to keep going because there's one thing that you don't do in Christianity and I'll tell you what it, what it is in a minute when I started doing it. Um, then I came across the story of Lot, or Lut alayhi salam. And we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in these stories, but there's a, another very twisted story in the Bible about Lot and his daughters. There's a story of Lot and his daughters uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible that says his daughters got him drunk one night and seduced him and committed incest with him. This is, the Bible, this is one of the Bible portrayals of the prophets of God. And it says that David saw, uh, saw this woman named Bathsheba, and she was one of the most beautiful women of her time. Uh, and she happened to be married to one of the commanders of his army named Uriah. But David on this day decided that he was not able to resist his temptation uh, to be with this woman Bathsheba, so he did. Uh, and he committed adultery with her. And knowing that he did this, he, the, the, the way that he decided to cover it up was he sent a letter to the generals of his army saying that when the battle was fierce for everyone to pull back and abandon Uriah uh, so that he would be killed and when he dies then he could have Bathsheba, no harm, no foul. So. David went from being the slayer of Goliath, the hero for man, to uh, an adulterer, a, a, a plotter, and a murderer. And so, this is when I really caught myself and said, hold on now. Something's wrong here, something's got to give. I said, because to me, God's prophets in my mind were people of example, people who I could follow as an example, someone who was supposed to be the best of us, so that we could follow them and emulate them. And I'm, they're turning out to be worse than some of the people that you see on America's Most Wanted. David is somebody that, if I only knew this about him from the Bible, I see him coming down the street, I'm going the other way and calling 911, because he has to have a warrant out on him for something. This is what I'm thinking in my mind, this man is not an honorable man at all. He, he, okay, he killed Goliath, yeah, but he killed this other guy named Uriah to be able to commit adultery with his wife. So I, 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 did, I committed the cardinal sin in Christianity. I started asking questions. Um, this is the one thing you do not do in Christianity is you don't ask questions, especially not about issues like this. Um, so I went to my pastor and I started asking questions. You know, what, what, what's going on here? You know, pastor, there's, there's a, a very bad recurring uh, habit about these men in the Bible. What is, what is the deal here? And I remember he told me the same thing that I 
almost every pastor or every evangelist or anyone I talked to about this, same, same, same answer, almost like it was programmed. They would put their hand on my shoulder and say, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith because you're not justified by knowledge, you're justified by faith. Uh, and they would quote me verses like lean not on understanding, you know, Paul's we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is all, they would quote this whole line of thing to me like it was already pre-programmed, that they, like they programmed in pastor school that people are going to ask you questions and here's the answer. There was one litmus test that I used for every religion. And when I saw it, whenever I met them or the people or whatever about this religion, I would always ask them, do you have a book? Do you have a book? Because another thing I had come to the conclusion of is that if your religion is true, you should be able to ha tangibly hand me something and show me that this religion is true. Give me something that I can see. I don't want to hear that faith stuff anymore. I heard that all my life, and it look where it got me. It got me thinking I'm driving a Mercedes running around in 1982, beat up Datsun. I said, no, you, you have to show me. And I, so I read the Bhagavad Gita, I read the Torah, I read the Scrolls of Tao, you know, I, I read the, the, the Code of the Bushido, I read the Wiccan Book of Spirits and Spells and all that other magic stuff they have. And I read all of these things, and I found something very congruent with all of it, was that there were very same philosophies and teachings in all of these major religious books. Uh, they all talked about God and His nature. Uh, most of them alluded to the fact that God is one and that God sends messengers to us and people to us to teach us. But they were filled with a whole bunch of, of, of garbage, to be, to be honest with you, that I couldn't logically, rationally believe. Um, so at about the age of 17, just about the time, about 17, um, 17 and a half, I, I gave up my search for uh, God. And I became kind of angry with God, but I said, here I am looking for you, and I can't find you and it doesn't look like you're giving me any help. And I don't know how many of you know, but for a 17 year old is frustrated with God and the world, there's a lot of trouble he can get into. There's a lot of things he can do uh, to put himself in predicaments uh, when he's frustrated the world and, and had come to the conception that, you know, if there's a God that exists, then he doesn't really care about me. You know, that's a kind of a dangerous young man. Um, so I started doing the whole partying in trouble, um, uh, going to parties, drinking underage, all of this stuff I started doing. You know, I, I'm a perfectionist at heart. Uh, so when I was a Christian, I tried to be a, 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 the best one I could. If I was going to switch to being uh, any other religion, then I was going to do that 100%. So you better believe when I went after the dunya, I, I did that 100%. It was my dad that never read the Bible. He never read one page of the Bible. He goes to church maybe once a year for Christmas, and that's basically it. He isn't into theology at all, but if you ask him, who is God, then he will say that God is one, and there's only one God and nobody is like God, right? And I told him about the concept of the Trinity, I think it's roughly, is it two years ago now? No, one and a half years ago, something on those lines. I told him about the concept of the Trinity, and he told me, wow, that sounds totally insane, why would they believe in that? And I told him, who's they? He said, yeah, you were talking about the Muslims, no? It's the Muslims that believe in this, like three in one God, no? No, Dad, that's what we believe. And he couldn't believe me. And he said, it's, it's total insanity. It doesn't make any sense. It's so ridiculous. Why would anybody think of that? And so he tried to wrap his head around it, which my dad usually never does. But he tried to understand it, understand it. And the next day he came to me. And I didn't even talk about it anymore. And he came to me the next day and said again, this is totally ridiculous. What are you talking about, man? Th this Trinity thing there. I thought we stopped talking about it, man. No, no, but it's really ridiculous. I don't know how they came up with this. It's so crazy. So yeah, anyways. His thoughts about Islam is that Islam is for the Albanians and for the Turks. He's a proud Christian without really understanding the ideology and the theology of Christianity. I'm not saying that to mock my own dad. Obviously not. This is just how people grew up on the Balkan. He grew up in Yugoslavia under communism, so they didn't learn anything about the religion. They simply knew what they were, and that's basically it. And yeah, nevertheless, he's identified as a Christian. He's identified as a Macedonian and therefore would heavily disagree with me. And for the rest of my family, it would be extremely strange, extremely strange, especially because I was so against Islam. So to my closest family, like sister, mother, etc., etc., it would be extremely strange because I hated Islam with a vengeance. I just hated it. And therefore they would be shocked. It said that Muslims were people who uh, worshiped a moon god named, named Allah, uh, who lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia. And uh, they were oppressive to women. The one thing that really caught my attention was the whole uh, chapter on jihad, where it said that Muslims were allowed to kill non-Muslims at any time, at any place, without discretion, and it was an honorable act, and not only would they go to heaven before it, but they would get 70 versions on the way. You know, so I closed the book on Islam, put it back on the shelf, and marked off Islam off my little list of religions.
and said thanks, but no thanks, and if I ever see a Muslim, I am out. Um, and I said, I'm pretty safe in Greenville, South Carolina. I had never seen a Muslim ever. So I said, you know, I don't have to worry about running into no Muslims, thank God. So, you know, I, 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 I started, you know, just worshiping, you know, I tried to just be a good person, you know, pray to God, ask him for guidance, try to be a genuinely good person. He said, have you ever heard of Islam? I said, yes, I've heard all about Islam. <laughs> he was like, okay, so what do you think of it? I said, what do you mean what I think of it? That's probably the worst religion I've ever seen on the face of the planet. He's like, why? And he's like, but I'm a Muslim. I was like, man, you gotta stop playing. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're, you're an African American. You know, he's like, so? I'm like, the book said you guys were Arab. They, all the Muslims were Arabs. He, and, and he was like, what else did you read in the book? And I told him, he was like, man, what in the, you know, what have you been reading? <laughs> he's like, you need to, 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 to go uh, to the mosque for Juma. He's like, I, he, he told me, he said, I'm not a good Muslim. This is what he said to me. He said, I'm not a good Muslim. I, I'm not even going to uh, try to front and say I'm a good Muslim. He said, but I can guide you to some people that can tell you the real truth about Islam. Uh, because he know about my story about wanting to find religion. And he said, you need to go to the mosque for Juma. And I said, what's, what's Juma? He said, it's just like church with no chairs. And I said, I can do church with no chairs because in church, the chairs were the worst part anyway. Because they have these hard benches that you sit on that are like this, and they're so hard. I said, that's good. You sit on carpet? Wow, man, they should, every church should be like that. You know, first I was shocked. Like, I've been living across the street from all these crazy Muslims all my life. You know, I said, I never knew. You know, and he told me to go to Juma, and I asked him what time. He said he would meet me there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. So I said, okay. I went on Friday, and I'm waiting outside for him. You know, I'm, I'm not going inside. That's not happening. So I went in, and they put me in the back and gave me a chair anyway. And I said, I came to sit on the floor. And they gave me a chair anyway, you know, and all of these people are piled up in front of me. And there's no Americans here. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, uh, if this is a setup. Because it's starting to smell like a setup to me. Because in my mind, I'm like... You've been set up before, and this, this seems kind of like this. So, and I'm starting to think in my head, you know, scenarios, you know, a young mind at play. And I said, this, this, this other guy, my friend, he probably was in the same situation like me, and he probably made a deal with them to get out as long as he brought other Americans and tricked them into coming to the mosque so they could do their jihad after Juma and get their 70 virgins. So I'm sitting here. And there's all these people in front of me, and then there's a curtain with all these people behind me making noise, and I have no idea who's back here. So I'm stuck in the middle of this. I hear that it's some women, uh, but I don't, you know, I, there's a curtain. I have no idea. So I'm like, there's something very odd about what's going on right here. I'm like, just let me make it. I'm starting to look for the exit. I'm like, you know, calculating how many people are between me and the exit. You know, I, I know some martial arts, so I said, I'm going to hit a couple of them, and I'm out. And then the imam came, and I, I just now realized that he was the imam because he got up on the minbar, you know, and they, and they started to call the adhan. And, you know, I said, okay, that man seemed nice. He seemed generally nice, so I, I felt a little more comfort. And then he got up uh, uh, after the, the adhan, and he started his khutbah. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaruhu wa I said, oh my God. I said, I bet you he's talking about me. You know, and he's being forceful, you know. He was getting loud and banging on the minbar, and he's pointing in my direction. You know, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get out of here really quick, you know. I said, well, I'm gonna take my chance with the women behind me. I'm going through the curtain. And then he started to, when he got done with his Arabic tirade, um, he started to explain it. You know, uh, that verily all praise belongs to, to, to uh, Allah alone, or God alone, and, and Him do we worship, and Him do we seek help and assistance. We seek refuge with Him from the evil that lies. You know, he explained what he said in Arabic, and it sounded to me so beautiful. It was very, very beautifully prose what he said, and I wanted to know where he got that. You know, I said, where did he get that? And then he tried to explain it to me a little bit how it came by. I said, nah, just give me the book, because the book should speak for itself. Um, so I took the Quran home, and on Friday night I started to read it, because it's a book I had never seen before. Uh, and I was very interested. So I, I went home and I opened this, opened the Quran, and I read the Fatiha. It seemed to me kind of like the Lord's Prayer, you know, it was a little, a little similar to what I found in the Bible. Um, but then I started to read Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, I started to read some of the Al-Imran, and I started to see names that I had seen before. I started to see names like Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, uh, Yahya, John the Baptist, Zechariah, Mary. And I said, I know all of these names, but there was something different about these people in this book. Uh, the prophets that I found in the Bible uh, were people that were deplorable, of, of not very good character. 
these same men in the Quran were someone who were at the highest echelon of moral character and moral fiber. They were someone that was an example to be followed because they lived the message that they preached. Therefore, they were uh, able to be followed and emulated. So, I read all of these chapters and I, and I read the story of, of Jesus. Uh, what was the thing that made you question your beliefs? And uh, what was it? When I found that there were contradictions in the Bible, I found out from the, actually the vicar, he was very good and he was very honest. And I said, well, you know, what's this, you know, why should I believe in God? Why should I believe in the Bible? And he said, well, you have to believe in your heart. And I said, well, what's the proof? So I asked him these questions. You know, well, you've got to believe in your heart. It's a feeling. And I thought, well, I believe in God, but actually if this text, if this book can't uh, prove that it's the word of God, and it has contradictions in it. And actually, if it was God's word, in my opinion, it would be perfect with no contradictions. Then actually, I don't think I can follow that. What were your thoughts about Islam? Well, I'd always mix with Muslims. Um, even as a, as a child, my father, as a professor, he had students who were Muslim. And so my first contact with Islam actually was through a girl that I used to go nightclubbing with as a, as a 17, 18 year old. I was about, probably about 18. And at the time, I left home at 16. I mean, this is how rebellious I was. And she said, no, come and stay at my house. So I went to stay at her house and she only had one book in the house. And this book is Al Quran. And the Quran, it just was the English and Arabic version. And so I said to her, because I was bored, teenager, I was bored and I was like, oh, look at this book. Can I have a look? So she said, okay, go have a wash, wash your hands. And <laughs> you can open the book and have a look. So I opened the book and I saw, subhanAllah, I saw the stories that I'd seen and loved in my Sunday school days. And I was like, wow, that's familiar. Because at school, and this is really important to note, in the West at school, you're taught Islam, Christianity as two completely separate things. There's no uh, autonomy or, or comparison between God and Allah. Allah is for Muslims and God is for Christians. It's like they're different gods, different religions. And um, that's what I had understood. And so I started asking questions to my friend. What's this book? Why is it so similar to Christianity? The Sheikh obviously gave him some verses, some ayat, which were relevant to what I was asking, which was scientific proof. I said, wow, that's amazing. And then he added something that was key, was that, oh, by the way, this was revealed to an illiterate guy in a desert like 1400 years ago. I was blown away. These were people I could follow. These were prophets. This was a book of guidance. And this was something that the book is calling and appealing to me. That if you don't believe in this book, you will never see that. I've never seen this in any other scripture. The direct challenges that are in the Quran, that if you don't believe this book is true, put it to the test. Put it to the test. And this was something that was so astounding to me. That God is telling you over and over again, if you don't believe this is the truth, test it. Bring me something else like it. Test it. Put it to test. If it was written, if there was more than, I mean, all of the analogies about God, everything was so logical, so rational, so reasonable in my mind that it was like two plus two equals four and that was it. There was no one plus one plus one equals three, egg, yolk, water, flight. There was none of that foolishness. The Quran was very direct and very straightforward in its teachings. So I gave my heart to Islam. Uh, that night in, uh, in my living room reading the Quran and you know and I, I cried and cried you know that I had been looking for the truth all this time had searched all this way and it was right across the street it was like my whole being was immersed in a warm fizzy feeling what like completely enveloped of course this is halawat al-iman so I had this halawat al-Iman, I remember turning to my friend and I said to her, I want to become Muslim and I want to do this like now. Do you know what the leap of faith they ask you to do is? The leap of faith is another word for ignoring all of these mistakes and blindly believing in a book written by men thinking that it's from God. If they have proof or at least if it makes sense, they will not ask you to take a leap of faith. The good news is, you don't have to anymore. I'm telling you, if you don't see proof, if it has mistakes, don't believe in anything blindly. God didn't ask you to pretend that a book full of mistakes is holy. God didn't ask you to completely go against logic and science just to have faith. And I always tell people, if you want to become an atheist, read and study the Bible. 
I used to be a devoted evangelical Christian. And I'm not talking about the kind of Christian that just shows up at church on Sunday and puts a Jesus quote on their Facebook bio. I used to get up every single morning and have a one to two hour quiet time with God where I would read the Bible and write in my journal and pray. I used to spend my extra babysitting money on books about creationism and apologetics and theology. And all I wanted as a 16, 17 year old girl was to make God proud and to be a shining light for Jesus. And so I studied the Bible a lot. But the more I studied, the more questions I had. And when I would come across something that didn't sit right with my sensibilities, I wouldn't just shrug it off and say, well, God's ways are higher than mine. You just gotta have faith. I wanted to be able to give an answer to anybody who questioned me about my faith. And the more I learned, the more questions I had and the less answers I had. And over time, I really started to see a very different story than what the church had taught me, a very different God than what the church had taught me. We start learning about how the Bible was formed, who wrote it or who didn't write it, the church history, where these stories came from, how the church has molded them and changed them to fit a narrative. That's when all of it started to fall apart for me. And I genuinely just wanted truth. I wanted to know the true God, not the God that my parents taught me, not the God that my church had taught me, not the God that was acceptable within society. I wanted to know the true God. Don't base your whole destiny and salvation on something that you know is a lie. God promised he will show you proof before asking you to worship him. سنريهم آياتنا في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق أولم يكف لربك أنه على كل شيء شهيد We will show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves until it becomes evident to them that he is the truth Scientific knowledge that was written in the Quran 1400 years ago was only available to humanity 50 years ago. Who else can write this other than God himself? It's a miracle. You should see it first and then decide. And if the miracle doesn't convince you, you're free to decide whatever you want. But if you refuse to even check it out, you're making a huge regretful mistake. For two years, I was battling with this thought, and I was trying to understand the Trinity, and I was trying to make myself believe the Trinity, but after all, all of those intentions have failed miserably, because I couldn't convince myself of a three-headed God. It didn't work. No matter how I looked at it, it just didn't add up, it didn't make sense for me, and therefore I was quite surprised, honestly quite shocked, that my religion entailed that. This was a wake-up call for me, because I was seeking a God in its unity, in its oneness, if you will, and not God as some sort of deity that I cannot comprehend. I always remind myself of the saying, your God is not a God of confusion. So it was very confusing to me, after all. Hence, for the very first time in my life, I considered, you know what, I'm going to read the enemy's book, the Quran. Why not? Because I started watching David Wood videos. And David Wood was so confident in his message that Muhammad was this degenerate guy and Islam was this evil, evil religion coming from Satan himself. The biggest deception known to mankind. The real Antichrist is Islam. So I got convinced even more about my own faith. I became arrogant, pompous. I said, God brought me back to orthodoxy, the real religion. He brought me back to the truth. And now I can truly see that Islam is from the devil. And because I have those eyes to see, I'm going to read the Quran and dismantle it. Many Muslims during that time reached out to me via YouTube, many followers of mine are Muslim, and said, hey, give it a shot. I said, no worries. I'm going to check it out and I'm going to find the devil in your book. So I opened the Quran and I started reading. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the merciful. That was surprising to me. It really was. I know to most Muslims, this is simply common sense. They're wondering what I'm talking about. But for me as a Christian, I didn't remember a page in the Bible that addresses God like that first. I kept on reading and I noticed that every surah, every chapter starts like that. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the merciful. And I was impressed. The message is crystal clear. By reading the Quran itself, it doesn't posture up or pose as something else. It simply says what it is. It comes as a guidance. It comes as a clarification for those that want to see. Again, very, very powerful, I have to say. So I continued reading. So devote yourself to the religion of monotheism. The natural instinct, Allah, God, has instilled in mankind. Yet again, 
simple but powerful. It rings true to me. It makes sense that we have a natural disposition in which we seek God. I think anybody can relate to that. When you were a child, most of us, we knew that there was a God. The oneness of God was crystal clear to us. We didn't think about other deities. We didn't think about a three-headed God system. Yes, I was shocked because Islam for me was a violent religion, a religion of the enemy, a religion of the devil, not a religion of the oneness of God, the oneness of God that everybody comprehends. Even my father, who is a Christian Orthodox, he doesn't go to church, he never read the Bible. When I ask him about God, he tells me that God is one, that God is the most powerful. He understands that too intuitively. And I am of the firm conviction, sue me, but that you don't have to be an intellectual in order to understand God. Intellectualism, study, doctor titles, all of that is fine here on earth in this creation. And you can impress other people with it, but instinctive understanding is embedded in you and even a beggar can understand God with it. That's how I see it. And therefore the Quran confirmed that. For me it was quite shocking however to realize after reading the Quran that most Muslims that I've met in my life, not all, but most Muslims that I've met in my life, actually didn't follow the Quran at all. Actually weren't even considered real Muslims. The Quran talked about humility. The Quran talked against being boastful. The Quran talked about no compulsion in religion. The Quran talked about that God guides who he wills. Another powerful message yet again is, it is Allah's pattern, ongoing since the past. You will never find any change in Allah's Header. That sentence really struck home because it showed the beautiful simplicity of the message. God's way is always the same. There is no change in the way, in the pattern of God. It is always the same, always accessible, the same way. And that of course made me think a lot about my own faith and about Christianity. Thinking about the sacrifice of Jesus for us, him being crucified so our sins can be forgiven, made me truly think about the people before him and people that didn't hear the message, etc, etc. Guys, needless to say, I obviously didn't find the devil within the Quran, but I found many, many warnings about the devil. The Quran warns multiple times about the devil. It clarifies how sneaky the devil is. It warns you of the devil and it glorifies God over and over and over again. Honestly, I tried to find the devil in the detail, but I failed. I couldn't find the devil within that scripture, no matter how hard I looked. Now, looking back, I really wonder where David Wood is getting his information from. It's quite interesting because I was following David Wood for roughly one and a half years and he was so adamant in his work warning all the people of bad, bad Islam. But after reading the Quran, I couldn't find the devil in it. I couldn't find the evil in it that was proclaimed by all the Christian apologists. I couldn't find the maliciousness, the perversion within the Quran. I found a concise, clear message within it. Take care, there are a lot of people who don't want you to read it even once. They want you to stay ignorant. We can talk about how their whole financial profits are dependent on your ignorance in another video. Subscribe so you won't miss it. But for now, we just want to emphasize on this. These people scaring you away from the Quran will not help you on the day of judgment. These people will not defend you when God asks you, why did you ignore my message to you? Why didn't you even read it and check for yourself if it's from me or fabricated? Nothing will change. It's basically the same teachings and laws, but you will get the correct description of who God is and who were his prophets. There is no difference between Romans' hate towards early Christians and your hate towards Muslims now. Don't let the media spreading lies about Muslims fool you. Don't let the media spreading lies about Quran fool you. Reading it yourself one time is enough for you to see the truth with your own eyes. Quran is not the book for Arabs, just like Bible is not the book for Aramaic and Hebrew people. Scriptures are for everyone. Rejecting Quran without reading it once is just arrogance. The Quran is not an Arabic copy of the Bible because if it was a copy, it will copy the same mistakes. It has the same teachings from the same God, but clarifies the mistakes and modifications and manipulations made by men on all their scriptures. If it's a copy, it will just copy the mistakes too.